Beloved, this morning I would like for you to turn to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, as uh, by God's grace we get to continue in the chapter by chapter, verse by verse exposition of God's word in this wonderful uh, gospel of the apostle John. Now, beloved, by God's grace, as I mentioned, we get to start yet another year. And, you know, um, the beginning of the year is it's a wonderful time to a time to plan, obviously, a time where we look forward to whatever changes, whatever growth uh, God has in store for us individually and corporately as a congregation. It is a time of expectation, the beginning of the new year. Um, so many things uh, we are praying for this year, and, and, um, and it's good. But you know what? The new year is also a wonderful time to reflect upon and rejoice upon that which never changes, which obviously is God's Word. And as we start this new year, let us rejoice in the never-changing promises of our God and Savior, one of which will be our focus for this morning's study. Now, this morning we're going to, uh, we're in John chapter 10 and we've come to a very familiar story. Um, perhaps in your Bibles, right above chapter 10, you see the heading, The Parable of the Good Shepherd. Now, one of the great dangers, uh, loved ones, I suggest, in approaching a well-known passage or story in Scripture is to approach it with an attitude of, oh, oh yes, I've heard this before and I know all about it. I know what it means. And fail to see if indeed we know the passage as well as we think we know it. Now this parable, or as a matter of fact, this figure of speech, there in verse 6, has been interpreted in, in many ways. And uh, particularly when it comes to who the characters are in this parable, in this story, or in this figure of speech as in verse 6. Now this section, or this story, this parable, if you will, covers 21 verses in chapter 10, and therefore I've decided to divide this section into two parts. This morning we will only cover the first part, which includes verses 1 through 10, under the title, I Am the Door. Now in the first 10 verses, we're going to focus on three truths concerning the true shepherd. Three truths concerning the true shepherd. And I'll give them to you now, so that you can follow uh, more simply later. First, we're going to focus on the identity of the true shepherd in verses 1 through 8. The identity of the true shepherd. Secondly, we're going to focus on the function of the true shepherd in verses 9 and 10. And within those verse, same verses, 9 and 10, we're going to thirdly focus on the benefit of being genuine sheep of the true shepherd. So hopefully you're there. Let us go ahead and read our text for this morning and then go before the Lord and ask for his guidance and blessing. The Apostle John, continuing, gives us the account of Christ's words by saying, Jesus speaking, saying, Truly, truly, I say to you, He who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of, a, of the voice of strangers. This figure of speech, Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, 
he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word. And as it is your word, we come humbly before you asking that through the empowerment of your Holy Spirit that you would grant us discernment, wisdom, understanding of what you have placed before us today. Fully aware that these words were not written to us specifically, but to those in, in Israel. But nevertheless, we see principles here that by your grace are applicable even to us today. So again, with humility of heart, we approach asking that you would go before us now. In Jesus' precious name, amen. As we read this figure of speech or parable, if you will, perhaps you said, oh, we read this before. It's perhaps one of my favorite parables, one of my favorite stories of Jesus being the one, the true shepherd. Now, I think it's important for us to understand or to acknowledge the fact that Jesus used many examples of just daily life in Israel to point to spiritual realities. In fact, that's really what's most simply a parable is. The themes of shepherds and flocks were very well known in Israel, and God used such imagery to convey um, much of His truth. Um, take, for instance, Israel's privilege to be the flock of the Lord in Psalm 100, verse 3, where the psalmist says, Know that the Lord Himself is God. It is He who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of his pasture. So Jews understood themselves uh, quite correctly to, uh, even as a whole, as Israel, to be the flock of God and to see God as their shepherd. So for Jesus to convey spiritual truth using um, analogies and, and, and examples of daily life was, was appropriate and effective. Now, of his flock, God employed under-shepherds, or for his flock, God employed under-shepherds to lead his flock in Israel's leaders, the teachers, the priests. Now, unfortunately, however, for many years since, since then, Israel's leaders were no longer shepherding God's flock rightly, but instead were using the flock. They were profiting from the flock. They had proven to be unfaithful shepherds. Now, of course, this was not new to the New Testament, for we read of this very thing going on even in the First Testament. For example, listen to what it says in Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 through 4, where the prophet writes, Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel concerning the shepherds who are tending my people. You have scattered my flock and driven them, them away and have not attended to them. Behold, I am about to attend to you for the evil of your deeds, declares the Lord. Then I myself will gather and uh, the remnant of my flock out of the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their pasture, and they will be fruitful and multiply. I will also rise up shepherds over them, and they will tend them, and they will not be afraid any longer, nor be terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. So again, this serves as a reminder that Jesus knew that his current readers here in chapter 10 well understood Israel or them as Jews to be the, the flock of God, God being the shepherd, but they also needed to be reminded that even in times past, God held these unfruitful, unprofitable shepherds that He appointed over His flock that 
caused the flock to scatter. They were not tending the flock. They were hurting the flock. They weren't protecting the flock. And as such, were deemed unprofitable shepherds and received the displeasure of the Lord to the degree that He told them that He was about to attend to you for the evil of your deeds, declares the Lord. Now, with this understanding, beloved, we, I suggest to you, much approach, must approach this text. Additionally, we must not separate our current text from that which preceded it in chapter 9. Chapter 10, please note, starts with the words, truly, truly, or verily, verily, or I tell you the truth, which signals Christ's declaration of divine truth concerning that which has already been discussed. Never in Scripture or never in the Gospels does the word, do the words, verily, verily, begin a new train of thought. Those words never introduce a, a, new, a new theme. But rather, when Jesus uses the words truly, truly, or verily, verily, He's saying, listen up, I'm going to uh, explain, I'm going to give you divine truth based on that which has already been discussed or that which has already been covered. So, very important to the understanding of this parable or this figure of speech is chapter 9, the events of chapter 9 which if you recall, focused on a man born blind, a beggar, whom Jesus healed. Consequently, because this blind man did not renounce, did not reject the divine nature of Christ, but instead even worshipped Him, He was kicked out of the synagogue. He was excommunicated. Nobody in the synagogue rejoiced over his healing. Instead, they kicked him out. Now, without background, understanding that here Jesus is going to be speaking to the Pharisees who were supposed to be God's under-shepherds, taking care of the flock, but instead they were hurting God's flock. So, chapter 10 is not a new, is, we're not introduced to a new theme, but rather I suggest to you that Jesus, now, based on what we studied in chapter 9, is going to unload, if you will, some divine truth upon these people who, if they were true under shepherds, would understand. But as we will read, not, uh, not today, but next week, we'll see that they didn't understand this. Proving that, in fact, they were not genuine under-shepherds of God's flock. So, let us begin by looking at the identity of the true shepherd. Jesus begins by saying, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. All right, so this is how we're going to approach it. Oftentimes when you see a parable or a figure of speech, as Jesus calls it, it is tempting to see, Lord, help us see what you are pointing to. Oftentimes in, in, in parables, there could be easily discernible uh, characters. For example, what is the door to the fold? Who is who are the the these the, these uh, those that climb and and um, uh, uh, that that are thieves and robbers? Who is the actual shepherd? Who's door? Who is the doorkeeper? And things like that. Now I've listened to several messages and and read several commentaries, and it's interesting uh, how people approach it. Uh, some people approach uh, the fold and they teach of the fold as being heaven or the church or Israel. And if you're not careful, you're saying, wow, I didn't know this text meant so many things. But as we're accustomed here, 
we understand that context is king. And we must interpret it completely in light of the context. So I made some notes. I got my little cheat sheet over here that as I went through the passage, I said, what could this mean? And then I made sure I checked my resources and checked to see that I was not making up stuff. You don't want a preacher that just makes up stuff. God forbid. So here he's speaking to the same audience of that of chapter 9. And I'll suggest to you he is addressing the leadership and those who have ears to hear. Notice that he says that he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. Let me suggest the, 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 some following uh, clarifications, if you will, or stuff to help us understand this better. He who does not enter by the door, I suggest you could very well mean that those who do not enter by the appointed method of God into the fold. Now let's talk about that. To what is Jesus referring when he says the fold? I'm going to suggest to you that he is speaking of Israel or specifically Judaism. Oh, preacher, that sounds new to me. Where did you get that? Very good question. Look at verse 16. We're not there yet, but look at verse 16. Let me see if I can show you why I believe that the fold is speaking of Israel, in particular Judaism. Notice that Jesus says, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. To whom is he referring when he says other sheep? I will suggest to you that that would be the Gentiles. And when he says that are not of this fold, I suggest to you he's speaking about Israel. Keep in mind, beloved, that Jesus here is still ministering to his people. He came to save the loss of the tribe of Israel. The church is not in existence. Of course, he's already ministered to Gentiles. He's not against Gentiles. The salvation has already come to the Samaritans. But here he is speaking specifically to particularly the leaders of Israel who have been derelict in their duty to protect the flock. And instead they are hurting the flock. These men, if you will, these leaders, these uh, thieves and robbers did not come to their appointed position by the door. That is, by the appointed method of God into that fold, into Israel, into Judaism, to the fold of God, the fold, the, the, the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way. And such a person is considered a thief and a robber. Okay, let me see if I can point, paint a picture. Here in Israel's time, during this time, in the larger towns and the larger cities, you would have a, 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 a sheep uh, a fold. You would have a place where shepherds would bring their flocks. It was, it was larger to where it was more of a communal flock, if you will. I mean, fold, if you will. The shepherd would come into town and uh, uh, require of the porter, the doorkeeper, if you will, uh, room for his sheep, and he would put a sheep in, and other shepherds would come and put their sheep in. It was uh, it was an actual uh, building. It was, it was fortified, uh, but obviously not perfectly because thieves would be able to climb over and and rob and and, and hurt the sheep. Um, so picture that in your mind, and Jesus reminds them in verse two. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. So that who, he who approaches that being authorized by God into the fold is indeed a shepherd. Again, I suggest to you, this is an indictment of the leadership of Israel at this point. Who have been derelict in their duties to protect, to care for, and to guide the flock, but instead is hurting the flock, their very own people. And here I suggest to you, Jesus is calling them thieves and robbers. Specifically, the Pharisees who thought, sought 
more for themselves than for the people of God. These men, I suggest to you, did not enter that fold by the door, the authorized, approved method of God, but took it. You know, it's interesting because if you do a study upon, particularly in that time, those positions of high priest and of Pharisees, they were extremely political. No longer was the position of a pious man, but, but they were pseudo-pious men. It was very political, very uh, uh, focused on, on wealth and popularity. It, it was not holy or wholesome in any way. Now notice, to him, to the true shepherd, a genuine shepherd, the doorkeeper. Pastor, who could the doorkeeper be? Well, I suggest to you that in this parable, the doorkeeper could very well mean be God. The doorkeeper of the fold, his fold, to whom he opens only to a genuine shepherd. Now, to this shepherd, now that I think we can get all right. Obviously, the shepherd is speaking of Christ. To this shepherd, the doorkeeper opens access to the fold. And notice that the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Here, beloved, I suggest to you that Christ is the shepherd who calls out his own from the fold of Judaism or Israel, if you will, that have been shepherded by terrible leaders. But this shepherd to whom God gives access, when he calls, please note that it says that he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And in this case, out of a legalistic, law-riddled system of religion. And notice that when he, the shepherd, puts out all of his own. He takes them out of that, that, that fold and he leads them out on his own. Now he goes ahead of them. Um, unlike Western shepherds, Eastern shepherds went ahead before their sheep. They didn't drive their sheep. They went ahead of their sheep. And notice that the sheep follow this genuine shepherd because they know his voice. Just like who? Just like the blind man heard his voice and began to follow Christ. So think of the imagery, particularly in light, in light of chapter 10, I mean chapter 9. This man, this blind man, was supposedly be, needed to be under the care of God's under-shepherds of Israel. But he didn't care for him. They kicked him out. So the genuine shepherd spoke to him and he called him. And this blind man responded and began to worship and follow the true shepherd. Christ had rescued this man from religious Judaism, from a system that was based on following the law. He puts his own out. And he went ahead of them. And, he, and, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. Now please note, verse 5. A stranger, they simply will not follow. It's interesting because experiments have been made, have been done. Particularly think of this sheepfold in the center of the town, in the center of the city, where many flocks were kept. At the time it was time to pick up the sheep, the doorkeeper would allow a, a, a shepherd to come in and the shepherd would call out his sheep. Now, there are other flocks amongst this shepherd's flock, but only his sheep will come out because they recognize their particular shepherd's voice. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. So that you have, say, a hundred sheep. You have a flock of 30. These shepherds would be able to call them, call them. I don't know. A brown nose, freckled face, 
I don't know, Snow White, Fluffy, whatever their name was, they would hear their shepherd's voice and they would come out. The rest would not come out because they do not heed a stranger's voice, only their shepherd's voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know a voice of a stranger. That is false shepherds. It's interesting that when we look at Christ's ministry there to the Jews, a call went out, but not all responded. And why did not all respond? Because... At that time, it was evident that they were not his sheep. Only his own respond when Christ calls them. Now, even though we, I think, could make a mistake of injecting ourselves into this, oh, this is speaking about us, I don't think it's dangerous to say there's a principle here that we could grab hold of, and that is this, flee from strangers because they do not know the voice of a stranger. Many years back, It's a young woman in in our congregation, I don't know, 15 years ago, who said, Pastor, she came in tears, Pastor, please, you need to pray. I said, what's going on? She goes, please pray for my sister. I go, what's wrong with your sister? Pastor, she lost her salvation. I'm afraid that she has lost her salvation. I said, why do you believe that? Well, she has joined the Jehovah's Witnesses. She was, we, we were born in, a, in an evangelical church, and uh, um, she's, I know that she was a Christian, but I fear that she has lost her salvation because she has followed the Jehovah's Witnesses. And I would say, okay, let's calm down, let's sit down, and let me see if I can share some, some things with you. I said, we are not going to pray that God would restore her salvation, for in fact, the very fact that she is following Jehovah's Witnesses proves that she was never part of God's flock in the first place. God forbid we think that once we're in the hands of God, we can be plucked out of it. We talked about several weeks ago. That's impossible. You see, the reason this young lady followed the Jehovah's Witnesses and their teaching is because she was not of the flock of God. Why do we know that? Because a stranger will simply not follow a false teacher. I mean, a a genuine sheep will never follow a stranger. It would be irrational to think that as she was contemplating becoming a Jehovah's Witness after supposedly being born and raised in a Christian home, being baptized, It's unreasonable to say or to think that as she was contemplating leaving evangelical Christianity, that Jesus would not be saying, please don't do that, please don't do that, please don't do that. You know the Holy Spirit would have been, uh, don't, 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 don't. But the reason, that she, the, the, the reason why she did go through with it and became a Jehovah's Witness is because she could not hear her shepherd's voice because she was not part of his flock. In the first place. So I told this young lady, she did not lose her salvation, beloved sister in Christ. She never had it. Otherwise, she would have never gone through this. She was never part of the flock and therefore never heard the shepherd's voice. So I believe that we can stand firm on on that principle and knowing that a stranger, they simply will not follow. A genuine sheep of the flock will not follow strangers because they do not know the voice of strangers. And that's why it should break our hearts every time we hear of somebody that is following some quack out there. We need to pray for them that they would genuinely be saved. For if anybody starts to follow a stranger, a heretic, a false teacher... That, in a very real way, points to the fact, the reality, that they may not be genuinely saved. They may not be genuinely part of Christ's flock. Now, please note verse 6. This figure of speech, Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. 
test question. Why did these people not understand what Jesus, what Jesus was saying? Because they were not of the flock. They have deaf ears. So Jesus tries again, if you will, in verse 7. So in verses 1 through 5, we've already seen the identity of the true shepherd. This, of course, being Christ. This, of course, being the one to whom the doorkeeper opens. This, of course, is the one who calls out his sheep by name and they follow him because they recognize his voice. So seven, he says, so Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, now here's something interesting. He says, I am the door of the sheep. And he said, okay, preacher, I'm a smart person. The door of verse seven is the same door of verse one. Well, I can see why you think that, but I'm going to tell you that the door of verse seven is not the same door of verse one. Why do you say that, preacher? Well, I say this for the following reason. In verse 1, please note that it says that he who does not enter by the door is different than when Christ says, I am the door of the sheep. Not by the door into the fold, but the door of the sheep. Look at it this way. Whereas the sheepfold of verse 1 is in, a, is in a large city, in a large town, where several shepherds uh, put their flocks by night and then pay a, 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 a doorkeeper or an under-shepherd to watch the flocks there and not to allow other, to do the very best to keep them safe. Here we're talking about a different fold. Picture Jesus, as he says here, he brings out his fold from that fold, from Israel or from Judaism, and brings those, his sheep, that really hear his voice, he draws them out of there. And they follow him away from religion, away from uh, 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 Judaistic uh, 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 religion. And he takes his fold now. Now think now of the shepherd out in the pasture. No longer in town, in the big fold where there were multiple shepherd sheep. There are multiple sheep. Here is his own flock that he has drawn out, and he's taking care of them. So truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door, he repeats again. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved, and I will go in and out, and they will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So here, beloved, I suggest to you, we not only see the identity of the shepherd, which is Christ, but also the function of the true shepherd. The true shepherd draws his flock away from danger. Now, this true shepherd, Jesus Christ, now, instead of being the shepherd that, goes, that has access through this, you know, that has that goes to the door and has access to bring out a sheep. When those once those sheep are drawn out, now he becomes the door. Out in the pastures, the folds were no longer large buildings; they were semicircular piles of rocks. There was no real gate, if you will. There was an entrance, but there was no gate. There was no doorkeeper anymore. So the shepherd himself would have to be the door, if you will, of their flocks out in the pasture. Many times these shepherds, and I'm sure you've heard this before, will lie down at the opening of these folds to protect their flock. No doorkeeper was employed at this point. You're on the pasture. You're not in the city. You're not in the town. You're the door now. So the true shepherd, Jesus Christ, also says that he is the door of the sheep, all those whom he has called. And please know verse 8, all who came before me, he's not saying, he's not deriding Moses or Abraham or, or David, God forbid, a shepherd in his own right. But please know that are thieves. He's speaking to the, to the derelict 
shepherds of Israel at that time who were not protecting the flock, but fleecing the flock, profiting from the flock. There were these under-shepherds that when the, if there was danger, they would flee. They would not lie down and give their life for the sheep. They would flee. So here Jesus says, but the sheep did not hear them. Boy, you know that they were so, they would be so upset with somebody like this blind man who would say, kick me out. Kick me out of the synagogue. I'm following him. They did not want to lose prestige. They did not want to lose power. And here's this man, Jesus, calling his own out and calling them from under their power. From under the law and the law system. I am the door, verse 9. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. And we'll go in and out and find pasture. Here we have a wonderful, wonderful promise. You love it. Not only for those who heard Christ during that time, but even for us today as well. For in this case, we can take hold of this promise. And I would say invitation. Whereas Christ, it is true, was speaking specifically to Jews, to the Jewish leaders, in principle we can take this and say, even though He may not have been speaking to, to us directly, we can rejoice in the fact that this promise remains. That Jesus is the door, not a door. Remember, the sheepfold back, it, it, the, the, it was a pin semicircular with only one entrance. And Jesus says, I am the door. In other words, there is no other way to enter in. And this not sh- surprise us because Jesus himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus says, I am the door. And notice this, this invitation where it says, if anyone... Yes, we're speaking about the elect that he calls out. There's no doubt about that. But here is the general understanding that if anyone enters through Christ, not the fold of chapter or verse 1, not the fold of Judaism or, or Israel, okay? He has a new fold, new flock, to which he's going to include Gentiles a little later. Okay, but here he says, if you come through this, through, into this fold through me, for I am the door. Guess what? You will be saved. And will go in and out and find pasture. In other words, will live in, 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 in their life in, 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 in safety and assurance. That's what awaits those who enter the fold through the only way to enter it through Christ and Christ alone. There is assurance. There is safety. In and out of this fold. And reminded of this wonderful benefit that if in fact we have entered through the door who, which is Christ, then there is security and there is safety. For you see, this shepherd is the true shepherd. Who, as we will see next week, will light down his life. For his sheep. Do not exhort the sheep or use the sheep, but give his life for the sheep. And he reminds them that the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And I would suggest to you that ultimately this, this thief is Satan whose primary desire is to steal and to kill and to destroy that which is Christ's as a genuine shepherd. And Satan working through his under-shepherds, if you will, his underlings, the religious leadership of the time, who didn't care about the blind man's healing. He didn't care about him. But instead kicked him out. Which is, in fact, 
destroying him. You destroy. You, you, that's basically you're 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 putting a uh, you, you kick a Jew out of the, the the synagogue, and we've talked about this at length. You, I mean, their livelihood is probably gone. They're an outcast. It's just really bad. So he reminds us that the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But notice what Jesus says. I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. They, to whom is he referring? To his flock. The ones whom he calls by name and they respond because he indeed is a true shepherd. To them he came that they may have life and have it abundantly. What a glorious, glorious reminder for us this morning, beloved, particularly as we hopefully see ourselves as part of this genuine flock of Christ. Now next week, I hope at least it will be a little clearer when we talk about in fact, when Jesus in fact calls himself the good shepherd. But see, that theme starts now in chapter 10. And here he calls himself the door. Hence the title. I'm not very smart. You know where I got my title, right? I am the door. That's what he says. I am the door. It's a wonderful reminder, beloved. Particularly in this new year where we think of things that are new and are expecting new things, well, at the same time, I suggest to you, we need to rejoice in the things that we've already known for a fact, and that is that for those who have come into the fold through the door, which is Christ Jesus, there is safety, security, and assurance forevermore. Tremendous benefits of being a genuine sheep of the true shepherd. We, we bask in this wonderful reality, particularly as we prepare our hearts to partake of the Lord's table this morning. So I'm going to ask um, the ushers to come forward and prepare the table. And as, as they're doing that, I would ask that you would, there in the quietness of your own heart, in the quietness of your own mind, ask the following question. Am I genuinely part of Jesus' flock? Have I genuinely heard the voice of my shepherd? Beloved, if you cannot answer that in the affirmative, I would ask particularly now as we, the church, prepare our hearts to partake of one of the two ordinances of the church that Jesus left the church, this being the Lord's table, where we celebrate the fact that we are called into a sheepfold by God's grace and nothing of our own merit. I ask you this morning that if you do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior of your heart, that you would cry out to Him this morning. That if indeed He is calling you into the fold, that you would respond to Him Follow Him, worship Him, brag about Him. Now for those of us, by God's grace, that have been called into this fold, not on our own accord or because we're good, but only by the simple grace and mercy of God, we come to the table this morning remembering that we, as God's genuine flock in Christ, must approach the Lord's table with extreme soberness and respect and awe 